Okay, let me see. Let's look at this. Let's look at this cliche. I can't save anybody. Only God can. You know that's Calvinistic. The idea that only God is active. Only God has a role in the salvation of sinners. That's not what the Bible says at all. In uh, James five twenty says, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, the, the, the verse previous says, brethren, if any of you do err, and one converteth him from, you know. So it's talking about us dealing with each other, us dealing with people. And it says, we convert the sinner from the error of his way. So here, conversion is being credited to the Christian. Or in 1 Corinthians 4.15, says, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Here's Paul saying, I have begotten you. And so the preacher and the word can and do, does save souls with the help of the Holy Spirit by the presentation of the gospel. We, ha we have an active role to play. Now, hey, in Acts... Day of Pentecost, this is Holy Ghost anointed preaching. What did Peter tell the crowd? Save yourselves, he said. Save yourselves from this on two word generation. That's Holy Ghost preaching. Now there's preachers today. How many preachers do you ever hear tell sinners, save yourself? Save yourself. I like, uh, I like William Booth. He would put out over his, uh, his, his meeting, his mission, a big banner that said, save your souls. Save your souls. Come to, the, come to our meeting and save your soul. You know, that's good preaching. There's preachers today, because of their theology, they can't tell anybody to save yourself. Because in their idea, God alone saves. The sinner can't do anything. God alone does it. Well, how, Peter said, save yourself. Look, if your theology doesn't let you preach like they did in the Bible, then your theology is not biblical. Um, so I told Jonathan, I said, hey, um, tell everybody they better come from the barbecue with an empty stomach because I'm going to give you the meat of the word tonight. Yeah. Was, I, was he in the shot? Okay. Well, let's pray. Father, I just pray for a wonderful meeting tonight, Lord, as we can minister and, you know, talk about your word. I just pray for your presence to be here, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be here, Lord. I don't want to speak without your spirit. I don't want to speak without your presence. I pray for the unction and anointing of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we can hammer out the scriptures to be concrete in our minds, Lord, that we can have these ideas developed in our minds so thoroughly that we'll know how to be the best soul winners that we can be, Lord, how to convert as many people as we possibly can, how to be the most effective that we possibly can for your kingdom, Lord. I pray that you bless the outreach tonight. I pray that you bless our efforts last night, that the seeds that were planted deep into their minds will one day, uh, you know, spring forth and give uh, forth fruit. Father, I just pray that you continue to water those seeds and uh, the seeds we're going to be planting tonight, that we might only say what is pleasing to you, that we might only do what is pleasing to you, that you give us the right word at the right time to speak it uh, to the right people. That's what we ask, Lord. We just want to be useful in your hands. We want to be useful to your kingdom, to your spirit. So I pray that you bless our session tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Alrighty. So I'm speaking tonight on this topic on um, how to convert sinners to Christ. This is a how-to message. How to convert sinners to Christ. This is the psychology of soul winning. And there is a definite psychology to it. Um, I, I spoke last night just to introduce myself, share with you my testimony, and I pray that you were encouraged by that because, um, you know, if the Lord could save me, he can really save anybody. So when we go out into the streets and we're dealing with some pretty gnarly people, uh, you know, uh, there's definitely hope. I, I think you just said recently, I just heard it, you said, uh, you know, uh, hope isn't really hope until the situation looks hopeless, you know. And that's the situation that we seem to be in in America is the situation is getting more and more uh, hopeless. Uh, but it's, I mean, what's, what's the most fertile field? It's the field full of manure. And that's what America is. It's the field, it's the field that's full of manure. And uh, as, as wicked as it becomes, that just makes the ground more fertile for the gospel. Every revival throughout history comes from that rotten, uh, fertile soil. You think of the revivals before uh, John Wesley started preaching. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Every sin that is happening in America was happening in England before the Methodist revival. And so when the situation uh, looks hopeless, that's all the more reason we should, we should have hope. And so my testimony is just uh, another one of many examples of uh, the Lord's, you know, saving the beggar from the dunghill, you know. Um, the promise of the gospel is not that you could have forgiveness while remaining sinful at heart. The promise of the gospel is a new heart. And that's what you see in the Bible, that he offers new people. Uh, he offers people a new heart. Now, the greatest task in all of the world is the task of soul winning. But as great of a, a task that it is, it's also the most neglected. It's the greatest thing that we could be involved in, is the work of soul winning, and yet it's the most neglected in uh, Christianity today. In fact, if you go to most churches today, you go to the average church today, you can find in most churches some uh, worship pastor or some full-time worship pastor. And I'm not against that. I just can't find it in the Bible. But what I do see in the Bible are evangelists. But how many churches do you know that have a full-time evangelist to teach the body of Christ how to witness? You can find full-time worship pastors. You can't find full-time evangelists who are supposed to be equipping the saints in the average, typical most uh, churches in America today. So that shows you the condition that we're in. So we need to study uh, how to be soul winners. We need to study how to convert sinners to Christ. We need to put forth effort to understand it. Um, the fact is, in America, it seems it's gotten so bad that, that homosexuals are more accepted by churches today than street preachers are. If you, if you come out as a homosexual in churches today, you'll, you'll find more acceptance than if you come out and say, I'm a street preacher. I, I preach in front of the bars. I preach in front of the clubs. So that's, that's, the, that's the terrible condition uh, that, that we're in. So to be a soul winner, to convert sinners to Christ, you have to start with the question, well, what is conversion? Well, what is regeneration? You know, you have to start with the end in mind. What's the goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? We want to see people saved. But in order to, uh, you know, to de determine the means to accomplish the end, you need to clearly define the end. In order to, you know, accomplish your goals, you need to clarify what your goals really are. And our goal is the conversion of sinners. Our goal is uh, regeneration of lost men. So we have to start with the question, well, what is that? Uh, in Acts 26, 18... Uh, well, you can start in verse 17. This is God speaking to Paul. He says, Delivering thee from the people or, and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So this gives you an example of really what conversion means. It's a turning from Satan unto God. 
uh, from darkness to light. A, from an unsanctified state, being unsanctified by unbelief, to then being sanctified by faith. And this is the objective that we're after. Now, regeneration and conversion are two terms that really describe the same thing. Uh, often regeneration, like Finney would say, regeneration often emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit in the uh, salvation of sinners, whereas conversion often emphasizes uh, the responsibility and role of man in salvation. But ultimately, regeneration, conversion, it's the same event, the salvation event. Uh, regeneration is a moral change. Uh, the term regeneration, it's a regenesis to get man back to the beginning. What did God create us for? What did God intend for us? And when the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, when God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in all the earth, it repented the Lord that he had made man and it grieved him in his heart. So man was never designed or created to sin. You know, like I said yesterday, pornography causes brain damage. Uh, you know, alcoholism destroys your liver, destroys your kidneys. We weren't designed to sin. Regeneration is bringing man back to the genesis of what we were intended to be. And that's holy people who, who aren't living a lifestyle of sin. And that's what I want to see. That's what the Lord uh, did in my life. He brought me out of my sin, out of my lifestyle of wickedness, into a holy life. And I just want to see the Lord move in everyone else's life the way he moved in mine. I want to see the drunkard become sober and the liar become honest. I want to see them regenerated, brought back to the original condition that God intended for man, which is to be holy. Now, salvation, what is salvation? Salvation. People, you know, salvation is uh, being saved, but saved from what? For most people, they think of salvation as just deliverance from hell. But salvation is first and foremost uh, salvation from sin. The Bible says, uh, you shall uh, call him Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins. From their sins. See, we're saved from hell only in consequence of being saved from sin. And uh, you're only saved from hell if you're first saved from sin. So salvation is a moral change that results in a change of destiny. But you don't have the latter without the former. You don't have the change of destiny without the change of character. And lots of people today are looking for salvation from hell who don't want to be saved from sin. They want to be saved in their sin. My objective when I'm evangelizing and witnessing is to save, the, save people from their sin, not to convince them that they can be saved in their sin, not to say, oh, God accepts you as you are. You're saved as you are. That's what some people try to evangelize and you know, convince people that, uh, you know, you're saved just the way you are, so long as you trust in Christ, so long as you believe in Christ, you're saved just the way you are, no change required, no change needed. And that's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to go through life without these than to be cast into hell. So Jesus taught there has to be a moral change and a moral transformation. And that's what we're going after. And so conversion, it's a turning of the will from sin to God. And to understand the psychology of man, the will, the faculty of the will is influenced by the ideas of the mind. When I was living in the world and I was filling my mind with the ideas of the world, this rap music and other things that I was listening to, those concepts, those ideas, that mindset affected the way I lived my life. Those, those ideas gave me certain attitudes and those attitudes affected how I lived. And so when you, when you see a sinner regenerated, they're regenerated by the renewing of their mind. And a street witnesses and street preachers, what we're doing is planting new ideas into their minds. Ideas they haven't thought about before. God's going to judge your life. There's a heaven or a hell when you die. You know, your drunkenness is moral insanity. I mean, we're planting ideas into their mind they've never contemplated before. And they're just seeds. Seeds that are planted into their mind that can bear fruit. Seeds that can 
uh, stick with them. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, everyone who saw us out there preaching last night, uh, they'll remember that. That's, that's not something they're easily going to forget. Uh, when you encounter a street preacher who's really preaching it out on the streets, that sticks in your mind. What he was saying, what he was doing, what he was emphasizing, it sticks in your mind. And so evangelism is really about making mental impressions. What's the impression that we're impressing onto their minds? What's the idea? What's the seed that you're planting into their mind? Because the will is influenced by ideas. And our objective is to turn their will from sin to God. So we present ideas to influence the decisions of their will. What is man? Man is a free moral agent, a responsible creature with free will. And as such, he's, he's dealt by God as a free moral agent. When God converts sinners, he doesn't overwhelm their will, he doesn't usurp their will, he turns their will. The Bible says, uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John uh, uh, 8, 32. Or in uh, John 6, 44 to 45, it says, uh, uh, no man can come unto me unless the Father which sent me draws him. Well, how does the Father draw him? Well, the next verse says, they shall all be taught of God. So the way God draws people unto Christ is not by some irresistible force, something that overpowers them. It's by the uh, drawing of the truth, by the influence of the truth presented to their minds. And we, uh, as uh, you know, Christians, want to be a part of that process. So the gospel, the truth of the gospel presented by Christians, uh, but it's, it's the Holy Spirit that gives it its power. Okay, there, Finney even talked about sometimes where uh, he says it's, it's the power of the truth, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit that's, that empowers the truth. There were times he felt his, in his own ministry as if the power left him. Like when he first got saved, like he would just speak a few words and people would come under such heavy conviction. The Spirit of God was on his words. But sometimes uh, he had to retreat into prayer and into fasting be, to, to renew this power from the Holy Spirit. It, you can have the same sermon preached by uh, two different people, word for word, and uh, one has power and unction and anointing, and one does not, because one has the, the touch of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit. What is the anointing? As far as I know, I think the anointing is nothing more than the presence of God. It's, the, it's just the presence of the Holy Spirit upon your life, upon your mind, upon your words. The, the, the anointing is nothing more, and walking in the anointing is nothing more than walking in the presence of God. And that comes through prayer, through fasting, through holy living. And so the sinner, in the process of regeneration, the sinner, the truth, the Christian, and the Spirit of God all have their active role in conversion. So we'll talk more about that. So more about this endowment from power from on high. Luke 24 Verse 49 says that the apostles who were given the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature were then, even though after they were told to go, now they're told to tarry until they are endued with power from on high. So we're not supposed to just go in our own strength or grow in our own wisdom, go in our own power, but to go in the endowment of power from on high. And the way to access that is through tarrying. To, you see, God promises the Spirit. All you have to do is stand on His promise. All you have to do to seek it is seek it. And I, I see in my own life and throughout my own ministry that when I really set time for prayer and really set time for fasting, there's a drastic difference in my preaching and in my ministry than when, when life gets too busy and these things get neglected. And so it's not difficult, it's not hard, and, and it's a promise in the Word, it just has to be sought after. Finney talked about times that the Holy Spirit was so, so strong on his life, he went into a factory, and, and the people in the factory knew who he was, there were these women that were working there, and I guess they, uh, they were kind of talking, uh, making jokes maybe about him, uh, frivolous attitude. And he looked at this woman, 
And all he did was have this very sober, very serious look on his face. And he, he says, while his mind was full of thoughts of their doom and of their destruction as sinners. And this woman, just, just by beholding the expression on his face, came under such heavy conviction from being this frivolous attitude that's joking and making fun to then such serious conviction without Finney even saying a word that she broke down, she couldn't work anymore. She couldn't function anymore. She felt so convicted. She felt so horrible. And that conviction spread from her throughout the whole factory. And the whole factory had to be shut down. They couldn't operate anymore until the owner, who was a Christian, told Finney that, uh, well, I, I think we need to minister to these people. They're all under such heavy conviction. A factory was shut down without Finney even preaching a word. Just by the impression that he put on their minds through his facial expression. Through the uh, unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit that was on his life. And that's walking in power. That's walking in the endowment and anointing of the Holy Spirit. I... I Preached for my first uh, year and a half of street preaching, doing different, you know, magic tricks and money trivia and all these, like a street performer type of a thing to try and get people to stop and get people uh, to listen. And it was a struggle. I mean, it was difficult. Uh, if you got 10 people to stop for 10 minutes, you were doing really good. Until I started really pursuing God during that time in my life in much prayer and much fasting. And I said, I just want to go out there in the anointing of God. I just want to go out there in the unction of God. I don't want I put all these worldly gimmicks and worldly tricks aside. And I just want to preach by the Spirit of God because that's what I see in the book of Acts. I don't, I don't see them doing money trivia and magic tricks and worldly gimmicks. What I see them doing is being full of the Holy Spirit and then preaching the word with power. And so I went out there just in the unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit to the same places I had been preaching for a year and a half every week. And now preaching boldly under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, people were stopping in their tracks. Of course, I'm pointing out their sins and rebuking their personal sins. But, but everything changes. Everything changes when you go out there in the unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit. But it's not a one-time thing. And that's the difficulty. You think you get full of the Holy Spirit and you get the anointing on your ministry that it's just going to stay there. It needs to be constantly renewed and constantly maintained. And, um, I mean, I, I've had times where I go out and I don't, I mean, I don't feel any unction or anointing from the Holy Spirit, and I'm just praying. I know it's just you get busy with life, you get busy with your wife, you get busy with kids, and, and, and you're not as close and intimate with God as, as you've been before. You're not praying and fasting as much as you've been before. Other times, I know I've gone out there with the unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit. There was one man, I was in uh, Missouri preaching on the streets and out in front of the bars. And, uh, well, one guy was so heavily convicted. Um, he didn't like my banner, my sign. And all the banner said was, like, turn to Jesus and live. I mean, that's like, you know, like a turn to Jesus and live. Like, it's a very, and the other side said, like, repent and believe the gospel. You know, like, very, very basic message. But the guy didn't like my banner, and so he, he's trying to, like, pull the banner down. I was on a wall preaching, and he's trying to pull the sign. It's got these metal poles. The metal poles, like, bent and, like, you know, like, out of shape because I'm fighting it and then he's pulling it and so we're just bending it and I guess those poles aren't really supposed to bend but but we did and uh, and so now I got this crooked banner and I had to straighten that out and uh, I still have those poles today they're all bent and dented I had to straighten them out it's you know like war scars you know from the battle you know but the banner took it all but then that same night, a different man came out of the bar. He's like, well, what's going on here? You know, and he's just partying with his friends. And I said, God's going to judge your life. And I start ministering to him very sober and serious and, um, and, and the, the presence of God and the anointing of the Spirit was there. And his, his face just like from being like a reckless, careless party goer, like I'm having fun. What are you guys up to? What's going on over here? So then he just became so convicted. He became just, just like tormented on his face. He had to sit down on the curb. He couldn't even stand anymore. And I just continued to minister to him. His girlfriend, who was like yelling and screaming at one of the other team members, you know, and, and she doesn't have the conviction on her at all. She comes and she sees her boyfriend. She's like, honey, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? He didn't even say a word to her. All she had to do was look at him and she saw something happened to you. What, what, what happened to you? He was so convicted. It was all over his face. 
I've had people when I'm preaching out on the street, they literally fall down on the ground, face first on the ground. As I'm preaching to them and they just start, they, they don't even hear my preaching anymore, they just start praying and asking God to forgive them. And, and, that's, and, I, and I get encouraged because when I read Finney or I read Wesley, the same thing happened during their preaching. Finney talked about preaching and people just fell out of their seats and, they, and, and, uh, and start, before he finishes his sermon, they just fall out of their seats and, and start praying and seeking God. And, and, and he can't, they don't, it's like they don't even hear anything he says after that point. He, nothing, or, Finney, or Wesley would preach and Wesley said that and the conviction would come so strong that there'd be like 1,800 people just lying on the ground. Now, I've never seen, like I said, I've seen it like one man here, one man there. I know there's untapped power. There's untapped potential that if we would just seek it, we could have it. And I've only seen glimpses of it. Now, um, can we save souls? Now, there's a cliche, oh, I can't save anybody. Only God can. You know, that's not biblical. And I'll show you through the word, this cliche. Let me tell you something. If, if there's a popular Christian cliche, it's probably wrong. Like that's, that's what I have found. If there's some, just a popular Christian cliche that everyone just accepts and nobody thinks hard about, you know, oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, you know, that's like a, a, a cliche. You know, that was an accusation. That was not something the Bible said about him. It said he was a glutton, a wine bibber, uh, and a friend of sinners. Well, was Jesus a glutton? Was Jesus a wine bibber? Was Jesus a friend of sinners? Well, you say, oh yeah, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Was he? He said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. You know? There's, a, there's another cliche, uh, Jesus paid our debt. Have you heard that cliche? Jesus paid our debt. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, people say that like it's a scripture, like it's a Bible verse. There's no Bible verse that says Jesus paid your debt. It's just not there. It's a cliche. The Bible says Jesus paid your ransom. Have you ever heard anybody say Jesus paid your ransom? See, the Bible says God forgives you your debt, that your debt is forgiven, your debt is pardoned. You see what I'm saying? The Bible says Jesus paid your debt, or the Bible says Jesus paid your ransom and forgives you your debt. But what preachers say is Jesus paid your debt. They don't say what the Bible says, they don't say, and what they say, the Bible doesn't say. So pretty, more often than not, if there's a popular Christian cliche, it's probably wrong. It's just the way, it just seems to be the general rule of thumb. Okay, let me see. Let's look at this, let's look at this cliche. I can't save anybody. Only God can. You know, that's Calvinistic. The idea that only God is active. Only God has a role in the salvation of sinners. It's not what the Bible says at all. In uh, James 5.20, says, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, the, the, the verse previous says, brethren, if any of you do err and one converteth him from, you know. So it's talking about us dealing with each other, us dealing with people. And it says, we convert the sinner from the error of his way. So here, conversion is being credited to the Christian. Or in 1 Corinthians 4.15, says, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Here's Paul saying, I have begotten you. And so the preacher and the word can and do, does save souls with the help of the Holy Spirit by the presentation of the gospel. We, ha we have an active role to play. Now, hey, in Acts, Day of Pentecost, this is Holy Ghost anointed preaching. What did Peter tell the crowd? Save yourselves, he said. Save yourselves from this on two word generation. That's Holy Ghost preaching. Now there's preachers today. How many preachers do you ever hear tell sinners, save yourself? Save yourself. I like, uh, I like William Booth. He would put out over his, uh, his, his meeting, his mission, a big banner that said, save your souls. Save your souls. Come to, the, come to the hard meeting and save your soul. You know, that's good preaching. There's preachers today, because of their theology, they can't tell anybody to save yourself. Because in their idea, God alone saves. The sinner can't do anything. God alone does it. 
Well, how, Peter said, save yourself. Look, if your theology doesn't let you preach like they did in the Bible, then your theology is not biblical. So you need to change your theology. So the salvation of a soul, it's not a what they call a monergistic work of God. Mono meaning alone. Uh, and so the idea that monergism is that God alone is active in the salvation of souls. That's not true at all. In fact, um, the Great Commission was given to the church. The work of reconciliation was given to the church. The salvation of the world will not happen without the active role of the church. The salvation of the world will not happen without the active work of Christians. God will not do it alone. It's like um, Hudson Taylor wanted to be a missionary to China. And he, he was sharing in church his burden to go to China, this unreached people group, this huge huge nation that's never heard the name of Christ and he wants to bring the gospel to them and of course an, an older more mature uh, believer said young man sit down if God wants to convert the heathen he'll do it without you so he had this Calvinistic idea of monergistic salvation God will just do it without you that's not how the Great Commission works that's not how the ministry of reconciliation works People say, oh, well, it is finished. What is finished? The salvation of the world? That's not finished. It is finished relates to the atonement of Christ. Jesus said it is finished. The atonement is finished. Not the salvation of the world is finished. The, not, the Great Commission isn't finished. The ministry of reconciliation spoken of in Corinthians, that's not finished. What's finished is the atonement, which makes salvation available. But for salvation to be applied, for salvation to be received, that's not finished. We have a work to do in sharing the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We are co-laborers with God. Laborers together with God. It, the, the Greek New Testament, the word for uh, laborer together or co-laborer, uh, it's, it's synagos, which is where you get the word synergy from, the doctrine of synergy. Uh, that's in contrast to monergism. Monergism says God alone is active in the salvation of souls. God alone is active. Synergism teaches that God and man are active. Uh, not just the sinner, but the Christian witness is active. That's why Finney said, both conversion and regeneration are sometimes in the Bible ascribed to God, sometimes to man, and sometimes to the subject. So the sinner is commanded to change, in many verses, the sinner is commanded to change his own heart. God said in Ezekiel, uh, make unto yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, for why shall you die? And you say, oh, that's Old Testament. Oh, that's, that's uh, you know, before the cross. Well, James says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. See, why was Stephen killed? Do you know why? He called Jews uncircumcised. He rebuked them. You do always resist the Holy Spirit. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you, he said. Now, what's he referring to? There's a, there's a verse in the Torah that says, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart. He's saying you are uncircumcised in heart. See, the Jews thought, well, we're saved, we're circumcised, you know, and all, but not in the heart, they're not. It was a heart matter. People say, oh, I'm saved, I'm baptized. In the heart? Are you baptized in heart? Are you washed in heart? It's the same concept. So the sinner is commanded to circumcise his heart. What did Jesus say? Jesus says to the Pharisees, he rebukes them, he says, cleanse first the inside of the cup and the outside will be clean also. That's something the sinner has to do. And it won't happen without the sinner's activity. Or uh, Jesus rebuked men for being slow of heart to believe. So man is responsible for the state of his heart. 
The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. If you hear it, so whatever, if your heart is hardened, if your heart is soft, you're responsible for the condition of your heart. It's, it's almost like a cliche. Only God can change the heart. Only God can change the heart. That's not true. The sinner has a, an active role. Now, it's no coincidence that those who say that God alone is active in regeneration, that man does nothing, are the same people who say man is still a sinner after regeneration. Well, that makes sense because uh, your moral character cannot be changed without your cooperation and, and uh, your consent. So yeah, if man is passive, of course his character is not going to change. Of course he's going to remain the same. The Bible doesn't call Christians sinners. The Bible calls Christians saints. The Bible says, if the righteous be scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? The Bible makes a distinction between the sinner and the saint. See, people want to reduce justification as just a legal declaration of righteousness. But in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. It gives a list of drunkards and fornicators. Then it says, and such were, past tense, such were some, were, were some of you, but you are washed, you are justified, you are sanctified. In that context, justification is spoken of as a moral change. Justification refers to being made righteous. It's not just a position, it's a character. When you're justified by faith, you become a righteous person by faith. And so the spirit, the truth, the preacher, the sinner, they're all involved in salvation, all having their different roles to play. So yes, we can save souls. We can save souls. Not without God's help. God has invited us into the work of salvation. God has invited us into participation in saving the world. When he gave us the Great Commission, he invited us into his work. So we are, as the, Paul said, co-laborers with God in a synergistic relationship. Now this understanding gives evangelism its urgency. It elevates its work to a very extreme eternal importance. That there are souls right now that could be saved if you get active, who could be damned if you're negligent. That the salvation of souls really does depend upon us preaching the gospel. That the future really is open. The salvation of a soul is a changing of the future. It's heaven or hell. When you get saved, you go from your future being hell to now your future being heaven. And by, by participating in the Great Commission and saving souls, we're changing the world. We're changing the future. We're changing eternal destinies. And there's souls right now, nations right now, who could be touched and changed and saved if you're urgent and diligent in this work, who, who will be damned if you're negligent. Imagine if Hudson Taylor never went to China. And we see all the revivals in China. And God is moving in China. Well, it all, it all had to start with one man going there. And the future could have been very different if he didn't. It's in light of this biblical doctrine of synergism, this openness of the future, we can see how vital fulfilling the Great Commission is. It's not just something we should do because, oh, well, God commands it, so we do it, but it's, it doesn't have any real significance. This idea that God has a set number that will be saved. Have you heard that before? That there's like the set number that will be saved? There's nothing you can do that will increase that number, nothing you can do that will you know, increase it or decrease it. If you're negligent, you won't decrease that number. If you're diligent, you won't increase it. So it rips the urgency out. But if you understand that there's a real, a, a real conditional relationship that we have, that we really contribute to the course of history, we really contribute to the course of, of the future, we have a role to play. This doctrine of synergism that we're co-laborers with God it lays the axe at the root of laziness for the Great Commission. Because the world will not be saved without the activity of the church. God will not do it alone. So we need to get out there. We need to do something. We need to preach the word. This gets into the psychology of soul winning. There's different kinds of sinners. They're not all the same. And how you witness to them, how you deal with them, how you talk to them, all needs to change in relation to what kind of sinner they are. So we need to be able to pinpoint what kind of sinner are we dealing with right now to know what to say, 
You need to know to whom you're speaking. So, like Finney broke it down, as far as I remember, into four different categories of sinners. Number one, there's a careless sinner. He doesn't care. He doesn't think about God, doesn't care about God. Number two, there's the awakened sinner. He's interested. He has questions. He wants to know. He's awakened to the reality of God and heaven and hell, life and death. He's thinking about it. He's awakened. Number three is uh, the convicted sinner. He knows he's a sinner. He knows that he's wrong. He's convicted about it. He feels bad about it. And then number four is the converted sinner. He's, he's repented of his sin. He's converted from sin to God. He's turned. So this is the psychology of soul winning. Now critics of revival sometimes will try and dismiss it Oh, revival, that's just a psychological phenomenon. You know, they study about, uh, you know, the revival of Jonathan Edwards. He preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Oh, that was, and people were falling out of their seats. And Oh, that's just a psychological phenomenon. Well, it is, yes. It is a psychological phenomenon. That doesn't mean it's not genuine. It doesn't mean it's not real. There are natural laws that God has used, and God uses even in supernatural revival. The laws of the mind. God doesn't violate the laws of the mind in revival. So even in supernatural revival, there's still natural laws that are in place. God deals with men as men, and he speaks to the mind of man as the mind of man. And therefore there's this psycho psychology behind soul winning and understanding the state of their mind. You know, careless, awakened, convicted, converted. That's all. Every one of those is a, is a psychological condition. It's a state of their mind. You know, the carnal mind, that's psychological. Repentance is psychological. Repentance is a change of mind. So let's uh, just go through these four categories. Now, just think about last night, based on these categories, people that we spoke with. There were people that just kept walking by. They didn't care. Not interested. Just keep walking. That's the careless sinner. They're careless. Everyone that we spoke to, everyone that we saw, falls into one of these categories. There were, the majority were careless. Then there were some who were awakened. I looked around and I saw all these small groups. People were talking. Suddenly, since we're there holding signs and we're preaching, people are, hey, I got some questions about God. I got questions about the Bible. See, they're awakened. They're, they're awakened and they're inquisitive. Then there was obviously some people that were angry. The, the hecklers. You know, I, I love it. When people get angry, I, I, I get excited when people get angry and I'm thinking, wow, like they're not, they're not careless. They're not awakened. They went straight to convicted. Like they're further along than the other people. They're further down the path than the other people. They're closer to salvation than the rest because their anger is simply their reaction to their conviction. They're, they're so convicted in their conscience that you, you either react in anger or you react in being converted. You know, like uh, Pastor Eli was talking to a woman, and she was obviously defending herself, justifying herself, showing off her Christian tattoos of how she's got a cross. She's trying to defend herself. Well, why is she defending herself? Because she feels convicted. The only reason she's defending herself is she feels the conviction. It's the apathetic crowds. If I preach and nobody gets angry and nobody gets converted, then I think I have a problem. Wesley said when you preach, men should either get angry or get converted. If one of those things does not happen, I don't think you're called to be a preacher. If you preach and everyone's apathetic, you need to examine your preaching. Because if they're not getting angry or converted, you're not hammering the points hard enough. You're not, you're not pushing the buttons like you ought to. And so uh, anger is just a sign of fighting conviction. So number one, the careless sinner. We read about him in uh, what, Romans uh, chapter 3. You know, and the Bible speaks about the sinner. Uh, God is in none of his thoughts. They don't seek God. They don't care about God. God is in none of their thoughts. That's the careless sinner. He's careless by his sin. Sin is, sin is the devil's distraction. That's all that it is, to distract you from God. Don't think about God. Here's some, here's some carnal pleasure. Oh, don't think about Judgment Day. Here's some carnal pleasure. Don't think about death. Here's some carnal pleasure. 
Sin is nothing more than the devil's distraction to distract the mind of man from the matters of eternity and the matters of God. To keep you from him. The sinner is careless by his sin. You know, uh, sinning makes you an idiot. No, it does. Sinning makes you mad. The sinner is in a mad pursuit of gratification. He's in a mad pursuit of pleasure. I'm going to smoke this. I'm going to drink this. I'm going to sleep around. It's it's insanity. What 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 it does to their to their own body? You think of how much a, a, a drug addict sacrifices just for his high, loses his uh, his health, loses his reputation, loses his job, loses his family, and and, it, and he sacrifices it all for that gratification. That's the that's a mad pursuit of pleasure, and that's what the sinner is in. It's, it's, it's insanity. And the vast majority of men in the world are in this condition. They're careless sinners, mad on sin. They're insane, idiots through sinning. And the vast majority of men, they're dumb, they're dead, they're blind, they're deaf. And it takes a loud shout to wake them up. It takes a bright light to get them out of bed. You know, there's people you're trying to, hey, wake up, wake up. You know, they're not waking up. So uh, my, I remember my, my mother, when we were little kids, you know, she would just, she was a long, we have this thing in our family, we could sleep, you know, like we can sleep good and long. And uh, just, just the way it is. And so my mom, she would sleep in or whatever, and grandma would be like, you need to wake up your mom. She'd send us in there with pots and pans. Like we'd have pots and pans on our head and, and we'd be banging them together and like doing a parade around my mom's bed. Grandma would send us in to wake her up. I just remember this. And that's like street preaching. The sinner is in a sleep of sin. He's in the bed of sin. He's careless. He wants to sleep on. We have to wake him up. So we have some signs and we stand up on the wall and we're, we're, we're trying to wake him up by a loud shout just to at least get him to the first stage. So you, you, can, you can go out there and get discouraged. Well, how many got saved? People say that to me all the time. How many, how many people got saved today? How many people got saved? You've been out here for an hour. Has anyone gotten saved yet? You don't understand the process it takes. You know, you don't understand. There's a, there's a process here. I'm just at least trying to get them from a careless sinner to an awakened sinner. I'm at least trying to get them interested. Like when I show up here at Texas A&M during the school year, and we'll, we are surrounded by like 100 students all asking us Bible questions, all asking us questions about God. And then, you know, some Christian comes up, some critic, well, how many got saved? I'm like, do you not see the hundred students here asking me questions about God? I got them from careless to awakened. That's a, that's a triumph in and of itself. And you want to know how many people repeated a prayer? Like, you don't, you don't understand true salvation. You don't understand the process. Look, harvest day doesn't happen on plowing day. You go to the farmer on plowing day, well, how many, uh, you know, how many... Uh, you know, pumpkins did you harvest today? What? I just planted the pumpkin seed. And you're asking me how many pumpkins I, I, I harvested today? You don't, you don't understand about farming. You're an idiot. You're just an idiot. You don't understand how farming works. And most Christians, so-called Christians, well, they're just idiots when it comes to soul winning. They don't understand how it works. They don't understand the process of farming. So you want to get... So the majority of men are just in this careless state. That's their default condition. The devil tries to keep them in it. We want to get them at least to awakened. You see that in Acts uh, 17, 32. It says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, well, some mocked, okay, that's the careless sinner, and others said, we will hear of thee of, again of this matter. We'll hear you another time. See, they're interested. They're awakened. They're like, hmm, that's an interesting thing you're talking about. I'd like to hear more. See, here you have the careless sinner just mocking, and then you have the awakened sinner. I'd like to talk to you more. You see that when you do campus ministry. I go out and I preach. And, of course, you have the mockers. And the mockers are out there to ridicule you. They're careless. They're, they're, they're frivolous in their attitude. But then you have people, especially afterwards, who come up and say, hey, I, I just have a few questions. And genuine, sincere questions. They're awakened. They're in a state of 
but you need to know what condition they're in to know how to deal with them. People get awakened by different things. They might be awakened by a preacher. They might be awakened by the death of a family member, by the death of a friend. I had a friend of mine, he, he was very interested in God and the Bible and had started, I mean, he hadn't, this was from before I got saved, he hadn't talked to me in 10 years. You know, we used to party, we used to do things together. He hadn't talked to me in 10 years until his father died. And then he was just asking me, hey, you know, like, how do you get to heaven? Do you, do you have to keep the commandments to go to heaven? Like, how do you get to heaven? You know, he wants to know because his dad just died. So I sent him a Bible and I ministered to him. So it was the death of a, of a loved one that awakened him. Now, he wasn't convicted yet. He wasn't converted, but he went from careless to awakened. That was the condition that he was in. Evidential apologetics should be a way to awaken the sinner. You show them the evidence of, for Christianity, the evidence for the resurrection, the genetic code that's in every cell of your body, the genetic code that's in every living life form, and the only known source of intelligent information is an intelligent mind. That means the simple cell of Darwin's world doesn't really exist because the cell is not so simple. It requires intelligent information, which we only know comes from an intelligent mind. So evidential apologetics could awaken somebody. Wow, you know, I never thought of that. That's interesting. I'd like to maybe pursue that line of reasoning some more. I have some questions about that. So they're awakened. Never, never, never confuse interest with conviction. Don't think just because they're awakened that now they're convicted and you should just tell them the gospel. Oh, you're awakened. Let me tell you. Oh, Jesus died for you, and and uh, and and just and just try and bypass this conviction. Just because they're awakened doesn't mean they're convicted. Just because they're asking you genuine, sincere questions doesn't mean they're for that farther along on this uh, course. You have to go through the process of conviction to move them from careless, awakened to convicted. Conviction is an essential yet often missing ingredient in the proper presentation of the gospel. I don't know, I'm not a baker, but I suppose it's like trying to bake a cake without eggs, you know, like I don't know if it can be done, you know. You think, well, I got everything else here, Every, all the other ingredients are here, it should be fine, right? Just miss one ingredient and you mess up the whole recipe. Okay, you have one missing ingredient, like conviction, you can mess up the whole thing. Preachers don't want to temporarily make sinners feel bad. And the result is that the sinner will eternally feel bad for eternity, be tormented in misery forever because a selfish preacher didn't want to make a sinner feel bad because then they might not like you. Because then they might get angry. They might not get converted. They might just get angry and storm off. Well, it's better to make a sinner feel bad temporarily by showing him his sin than to have a sinner feel bad for eternity because you neglected to show him his sin. So what is conviction? Conviction is when the sinner comes face to face with the reality of his own choices. That's when conviction occurs. When a sinner comes face to face with the reality of his own choices. Conviction happens when the sinner sees himself and sees his sin in the light of truth. As he really is. As his sins really are as God sees them. That's, that's when conviction occurs. When a sinner sees himself the way God sees him. When the sinner sees his sin the way God sees his sin. See, the devil is looking at sin through the eyes of the devil. Through the deception of the devil. How does the devil get men to sin? He lies to them. This is good for you. This is going to bless your life. This is going to benefit you. This is wonderful. That's how he got Adam and Eve to sin. He lied to them. He deceived them. The devil is looking at sin through the eyes, or, or the sinner is looking at sin through the eyes of the devil. What you want the sinner to do is look at sin through the eyes of God, through the eyes of truth, through the eyes of reality, to see it for the destructive, horrible thing that it is, a mass killer. I said, don't you understand, when you embrace your sin with open arms, you're embracing your murderer with open arms. You hear in the news all the time about like these girls who were killed by their boyfriend. Well, had they only known the true character of their boyfriend, they would have never embraced him with open arms. And that's what sin is like. Sin's like, oh, your murderous boyfriend who's just waiting to cut your throat, use you and abuse you and kill you, and, <laughs> and you just want to embrace him. That's what sin is. 
So we want to we want to awaken them to the reality of what sin really is, that they might, we, as as ministers, as preachers, as witnesses, we want to speak the mind of God, that the sinner might see himself and his sin the way God does. Now here's another point: whose job is it to convict the sinner? Holy Spirit, right? That's what the cliche says. And what do we learn about cliches? They're usually wrong. Have you, ever, have you ever studied the Bible on that topic? Whose job is it to convict the sinner? What does the Bible say? Where does it say it's only the Holy Spirit's job? Let me, let me do a little Bible study on this. They say it's not our job to convict the sinner. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Oh, well, that'd be nice. That'd make my job easier. I don't, need to, I, don't need to, I don't need to worry about their conviction. Just let the Holy Spirit worry about that. I don't need to worry about that. That'd be, that, that'd be a nice cop-out. That's a popular Christian cliche. It means it's probably wrong. And uh, it's probably not scriptural. So let's examine. What does the Bible say? Uh, I had someone on my Facebook. They said not too long ago, so I made a blog post about this whole issue. They said it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one that convicts us of righteousness, not any preacher. I responded. I said it's actually both. See, the Bible says in one verse... John 16, 8, and when he is come, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. That's elecho, which is to convict. Elecho, the word reprove, means to convict. So some translations will say he will convict the world of sin. King James says he will reprove the world of sin. Elecho. Um, so based on this verse, you can say, well, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict, right? Sure, it is. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict. That's what the verse says. He's going to do that. But what about John 8, 9? It says, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the eldest, unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Here it says the conscience did it. Is it the conscience's job to convict? Sure it is. That's what it's there for. The Holy Spirit, it's his job to convict. Does he do it without the conscience? No, he does it through the conscience. The conscience convicts. So it's not the Holy Spirit alone. It's also the nature of man, the conscience that God put inside of man's nature. But then you don't hear people say, oh, it's not the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's the conscience's job to convict. Just because, well, the Bible says the conscience convicted them. That would be the same hermeneutics applied to the, to the first. We say it's the Holy Spirit's job alone. Well, why don't you say it's the conscience jobs alone? Now here, in many, many verses, it says, And Herod, being reproved by him, talking about John the Baptist in Luke 3.19, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife. That's eleko, which means to convict, to reprove. The same thing the Holy Spirit was supposed to come to do, John the Baptist did with King Herod. So, the, so who convicted King Herod? Well, was Herod convicted by, by his conscience? Yeah. Was John the Baptist full of the Holy Ghost since his mother's womb? So a Holy Spirit-filled man convicted the sinner through his conscience. So it's not the Holy Spirit without the preacher. It's not, it's not, it's not the conscience without the Holy Spirit. It's the conscience working, being convicted through the preaching of a Holy Spirit-filled preacher. Amen. So you can't say, oh, well, it's not my job to convict. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. Well, he wants to use you to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 5.11 says, having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That's aleko. Aleko. <laughs> 1 Timothy 5.20 them that sin, reprove, convict before all. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove. Aleko, to convict, rebuke, exhort with all. We're commanded to convict them. We're commanded to do it. Many, many other verses where the Bible says uh, to convince the gainsayers. Same word, to convict. The Bible says, these things speak, exhort, rebuke with all, long, or with all authority. So yes, it's both. So how do, we, how do we then, as 
Holy Spirit filled believers convict. It's through the law, through the preaching of the law. If you turn to Romans chapter 7, you see this man who says, I was alive without the law once, but when sin, re sin revived and I died, and he's having this encounter with the commandments, saying that the commandments worked in him all manner of con concupiscence. So he's having this, this experience, this encounter with the law of God. And he gets to the point where he says, he delights in the law after the inward man. What's that? Well, his conscience. The inward man is your conscience. And every sinner delights in the law of God. Uh, Hollywood wouldn't be in business if it, if it wasn't that way, because when they have these movies, good versus evil, and we all want the, you know, Superman to save the world, right? We all approve of the good. We all say, oh, the bad guy who wants to kill the world, he's bad. Every sinner roots for the good guy. Every sinner, you know, enjoys watching a good movie of good versus evil, because they delight in the law after the inward man, you know? They might sin against others, but they sure get upset when you sin against them. They approve of the law. But they do what they hate. When you come to a place of conviction, you do what you hate, and you hate what you do. So Romans 7 is a, is a description of a convicted man under the conviction of the law. So what we need to do is preach the law, and our, not just preach the good news of the gospel. There's a reason that the Old Testament came before the New Testament. There's a reason the law came before the gospel. That's the way the Bible was written, and that's the way we ought to preach, to lay the foundation, to show them their sin, that they might see their need of the Savior. Because if they don't understand the depravity of their sin, they won't understand their need of salvation. Now, grace is conditional. You have to even, you know, the subcategory, dealing with sinners, I think Ray Comfort gave a great principle, law to the proud and grace to the humble. Is this, ask yourself, is this person humble? Are they admitting that their sin is wrong? Are they admitting that they deserve hell? If they are, then hey, they're ready for the gospel. But are they proud? Do they say, my sin's not really sin. It's not really a sin for me to get drunk. It's not really a sin for me to be a homosexual. Are they defending it? Are they justifying it? Because if they're still in this proud condition, oh, I don't deserve hell. I'm a good person. I deserve to go to heaven. They're not ready for the gospel. They're going to trample it. They're going to they don't understand it. They won't, they won't receive it until they get to a place of brokenness and humility. So it's law to the proud because the law humbles them. And then grace to the humble because the grace will save them. So you minister to them law or grace based on their state of mind and their condition. Now, people get angry when you wake them up or when you accuse them. So you deal with angry sinners. But like I said, anger is a good thing. So long as they're being convicted by the law, so long as they're being convicted by their sin, and not being angry because you're just a big meanie, you know, because you're doing it wrong or something. You know? Now, if they're convicted, ask yourself too, well, what kind of convicted sinner are they? Are they? If they're in the state of conviction, are they convicted and humbled by it? Or are they, like Peter at Pentecost, he preached and they were pierced in their heart. And they cried, what must we do to be saved? They were convicted and humbled. But Stephen also preached by the Holy Spirit, says they were convicted in their hearts, and they picked up stones to stone him. They were convicted and angered. So you have to also ask yourself, what kind of convicted sinner are they? Are they humbled by that conviction, or are they just angered by it? Different kind of convicted sinners. Now, if the sinner holds on to any excuse for sin, any type of justification, he's not yet ready to be converted. Every excuse needs to be destroyed. Every excuse needs to be demolished. He must clearly see that he's a responsible free moral agent, that he has a free will. He was fully capable of obeying God's law, but he didn't. He has no excuse for his sin. He, not the law, he is at fault. See, if the sinner says, well, God's law is just too hard, it's impossible. Then he's just blaming the law. He's just shifting blame from, it's not my fault. God was unreasonable in what he demanded. God's unreasonable in what he required. His law is too hard. You know? But when he sees himself as God's law was reasonable, God's law was just, but he refused to do what God reasonably required. Well, it's not the law of God that's at fault. Now it's him. Now he gets to a place of real conviction. He's giving up his excuse. So the sinner needs to see that he is without excuse, that he's unjustified, 
that his damnation would be justice, that God's law was wisdom, that sin was folly. And that's when he sees himself in need of a real Savior. Confession and repentance. Confession is an acknowledgement that your sin was wrong. If you're justifying it, it's not that bad, it's not wrong, it's not a sin. That's justification for your sin, not confession. Confession is saying, I, I did it and I'm wrong. it was wrong. It was wrong what I did. That's confession. An acknowledgement of wrong. And repentance. Taking full responsibility for your sin. I did it, no excuses, and I'm, I'm going to change it. I'm going I'm to do it differently now. So the objective of the soul winner is to clearly show the wisdom of God's law, the folly of sin, the justice of damnation, and the unjustified state of wickedness. The sinner must be shown that in his sinful condition, he's unjustified, inexcusable, and undone. It's only when the sinner sees, clearly sees, the justice for his damnation that he can possibly see his need for mercy and salvation. Because if, if your damnation's not justified, your salvation's not mercy. Now, it's a fatal mistake, a fatal mistake of the worst kind to confuse conviction with conversion. There's lots of people who think they're converted. They think they're Christians because they feel bad for their sin. I've heard preachers say these things. Oh, I know I'm a Christian, even though I keep sinning, I keep living in sin, but I know I'm a Christian because uh, sinners don't feel bad for their sin. The fact that I feel bad for doing it shows that I must be regenerated. That's a, that's a fatal mistake. Feeling bad about it just means your conscience is alive. It doesn't mean you're regenerated at all. It just means your conscience is awakened. Your conscience is working. Just because you feel bad for your sinning doesn't mean you're converted at all. And that's, a, that's an error of the worst kind when you're witnessing as well, when you deal with someone who's really convicted and you just think, oh, well, they're, they're convicted. Oh, they must already be converted. Lots of people relate to Romans 7 as the Christian life. And that's what they theologians will teach. Romans 7 is the Christian life. Romans 7 describes a sinner under a state of conviction, a wretched man. Is wretchedness a fruit of the Spirit? Is joy a fruit of the Spirit? Do you know what wretched means? Miserable. Wretched doesn't mean sinful. People think it does. It means, it means miserable. The man in Romans 7 is miserable because he's convicted by the law. He doesn't have peace with God yet. He doesn't have peace of mind yet. He doesn't have peace of conscience yet. That was not Paul's Christian life. What did Paul say about his Christian life? He had a conscience void of offense. That's what Paul said about the Christian life. His, his own Christian life. A conscience void of offense. The man in Romans 7... He doesn't have a conscience void of offense. He says, I do that which I hate. I hate that which I do. Romans 7 is describing an unconverted, yet convicted sinner. And for the vast majority of Christians to relate to Romans 7 as the Christian life just means the vast majority of professing Christians are yet unconverted, yet convicted sinners. Because it wasn't until the end of the chapter he said, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. He then goes on to Romans 8, 1. There is now no condemnation of those who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. See, the man in Romans 7 was under condemnation. The con his conscience condemned him. His conscience told him he's wrong. But when he gets converted and he's walking by the Spirit, not by the flesh, well, now there's no condemnation. His conscience is clean. He has peace of mind, peace with God, peace of conscience. So it's a fatal mistake to confuse conviction with conversion. Just because you feel convicted doesn't mean you're a Christian. And you have like in uh, King Agrippa in Acts 26 to 27, says, uh, Paul said, don't you believe in the, the prophets? And Agrippa says, you almost uh, persuadeth me to become a Christian. So he was convinced by the prophets of the truth. The truth was pulling him, convincing his mind, but he wasn't yet converted. The, the huge gap between convicted and converted. Now lastly, the last condition is a converted sinner. As uh, Well, the Bible, Acts 26, verse 20.
But he said, show first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. This is talking about conversion. Repenting of your sin. Now the sinner is carnally minded. And to repent means to change your mind. His mindset is for self-gratification. His mindset is for sin. To repent is to change your mind. Now the will is a faculty of the mind. So when the Bible talks about changing your mind, that's not talking about like just changing your opinion. It's about changing your purpose. You know, when you, if I say, oh, I was going to take a trip to uh, Canada, but I didn't go because I changed my mind. You see what I'm saying? It's more than just a change of opinion. It's a change of plans. And that's what real repentance is. It's a change of plans, a change of mind that results in a change of life. That's what the Bible refers to as the works that are meat for repentance. Another fatal error common today, people say, you don't have to repent of your sins. That's works. That's works. We're not saved by works. You don't have to repent of your sins. We're not saved by works. That's fatal. Repentance is not a work. The word work in Greek is organ. It means deed. Repentance is not a deed. Repentance is a change of mind about your deeds. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of deeds. Repentance isn't a deed. It's not an act, physical act. So the Bible calls that fruit that's meat for repentance. So in this verse, you see a difference between repent and works. Repent, turn to God, and do works. So there's a difference. Repentance and works. There's a difference. They, they point out in like Jonah 3, it says they turned from their wickedness and God saw their works. And they say, oh, see, look, repentance is a work. No, repentance results in works, which is the proof of repentance. God saw their works, which was the proof of their repentance. So this is, this is what we want to see. This is, the con this is the converted sinner. He has works, good works that prove his repentance. Acts 19.19, 19. look at this. Wrapping it up here. Acts 19.19 19. says, Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together, means magic arts, and they burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So, see, verse 18 before that, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. See, they repented of the magic arts, so they burned their, you know, Harry Potter books, right? That's what they did. They, they showed by their deeds that they were changing their mind, changing their life. So that's the, that's the converted sinner. So I don't, you know, I don't ask people anymore, are you saved? Are you saved? I mean, every hypocritical Christian will say, yes, I'm saved. So what's the point of asking? Every hypocrite will say, I'm saved. Don't ask them, are you saved? The Bible says, he that is uh, born of God doeth righteousness. He that doeth not righteousness is not of God. Doeth righteousness in the Greek, you know, can mean to practice righteousness. So I just, I, instead of asking them, are you saved? I ask, are you practicing righteousness? Can you say that you are practicing righteousness? If you can't say you're practicing righteousness, according to 1 John, you're not of God. I, I, it's not about, oh, did you say a prayer when you were a child, or did you walk an aisle? Are you practicing righteousness? Because that's the evidence and proof of your salvation. That's the evidence and proof of being born of God. So a much better question than are you saved is are you practicing righteousness? Now, it's easy to get converts if all you have to do is get them to repeat a prayer. Hey, do you know if you're going to go to heaven when you die? Oh, you don't know. Would you like to know? Sure. Well, repeat after me. Boom, that's easy, right? Who doesn't want to be sure they're going to heaven when they die? If, if the objective is not real conversion, turning them from sin to God, if there's no real repentance, a surrender of themselves, oh, it's easy to get people to repeat a prayer. It's easy to get people to say they want to go to heaven. That's not what we're after. We're after real conversions. People actually turn from sin to God, to repent and surrender all. Jesus didn't lower the bar to make it as easy as possible. He didn't broaden the gate. He said, narrow is the way. 
you know, people came to him and said, Jesus, what you're, pre what you're preaching um, against the Pharisees, that's offending us also as lawyers. So what did Jesus say? Oh, I'm so sorry. I offended you lawyers. Let me tone it down. I hope you can forgive me. You know, he turned to them and he said, woe to you lawyers. That's how he's responded to that. The lawyers came to him and said, you know, what you're saying to the Pharisees offends us as well. So he turns to them and says, woe to you lawyers. You know, he had the 7,000 and uh, that followed him down to like 5,000. And then like more, it says, um, when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, many of them were offended and followed him no more. Many of his disciples, John 6, 66, 666, John 6, 66, many of his disciples followed him no more. And then what did he do? He turned to the 12 and he said, uh, will you also go? It's like a reverse altar call. You know, are you going to leave too? He's not saying follow me anymore. He's saying, don't come. He's saying, are you going to go? You know, it was a, it was the reverse. He he didn't he didn't lower the standard to make it as easy as possible. He made it as hard as possible. He said, unless you forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. It doesn't get any harder than that. Unless you forsake all that you have. Think about how Jesus dealt with the rich young ruler. Here's a guy who comes to him, rich successful, seems to love God, all these things I've kept from my youth, he says. You know, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And I mean, if, if the rich young ruler went to most churches today, they'd make him an elder. Right? He's rich, must be responsible, an intelligent guy, seems to love God, been keeping the commandments from his youth. Right? Wants to... What, what, what must I do to you know, inherit eternal life? Oh, it's easy. Just believe in me and repeat this prayer. No. Jesus says you need to forsake all that you have to be my disciple. Go sell all that you have, he says. He made it as hard as possible. And when the guy turned away, he didn't run after him saying, oh, I'm sorry I made it too hard for you. But you have evangelists that you know, want to make it as easy as possible. Just, just repeat this prayer. Just acknowledge Jesus lived and died for you and, and you're saved. No repentance, no surrender, no forsaking all. That's not what we're after. It's not what we want. So man's a free moral agent moved by motives presented to his mind. The Bible says repent, which is an action, a choice, for the remission of sins. That's a motive. Repent, that's a decision of the will, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The Bible says let the wicked forsake his way, let the unrighteous man his thoughts, let him return to the Lord, and he will abundantly pardon. So you always see decisions being tied with motives. We are out there wanting them to repent, which is a decision. We're giving them motives. Now, the carnal man, sometimes you have to start with something as very carnal. Is that, you know, the, the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Right? And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from iniquity. Jesus said, uh, fear God, who can destroy body and soul in hell. So sometimes you have to start with a carnal sinner who is just so self-absorbed, all he cares about is, is himself. You know, you could say, hey, your sin is hurting other people. Yeah, I know, I don't care. Hey, your sin is hurting God. I, I don't care. You know, he's, he's, all he cares about is himself. So, hey, how, you, you need to repent. Well, what for? Because God's going to burn you forever. <laughs> what? God's going to burn me forever? Well, now you have his interest. Now he went from careless to awakened. Right? So, yeah, I mean, sometimes I preach on the streets, and I say, you need to repent. Well, why do I need to do that? So, because God's going to burn you forever. That's why you should repent. Does, does that make any sense to you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that's a good reason. <laughs> you know, carnal sinner, all he thinks about is himself. But now he's, you know, oh, really? Well, you can take it from there, you know. Why is God going to burn me forever? Well, because your sin is so bad. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you how stupid your sin is, how selfish it is, how rotten it is. Hell is an expression of God's view of sin. So motives tied to decisions. Man's a moral agent. We present motives to his mind to influence his will. There's also the motive of love. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ. And so it's really ultimately the atonement of Christ where we fall in love with God, that he manifested at the cross not just his view of sin, but his love for the sinner. Not just his hatred and opposition for sin, but his, his devotion and care to the sinner. And so we preach the cross of Christ 
to convert them. We preach the law to convict them, preach the cross to convert them. Because we love him because he first loved us. Now love is a motive. So it's not either or. Well, is it fear or love? The Bible preaches both. The fear of God's the beginning of wisdom. And at, and, and at the same time, we love him because he first loved us. So it's, it's fear and love. We preach both. So just, you know, this is talking about the process, the psychology of conversion. Whenever you lead someone to the Lord, just remember there's a process that takes place. And you can get all puffed up. I led somebody to the Lord today. But do you know how many people witnessed to him before you led him to the Lord? It takes like the average person like, you know, seven or ten times of hearing the gospel before they receive it. And you might reap the fruit of that, but you don't realize his mother was witnessing to him, his grandmother was witnessing to him, and he had friends at school who witnessed to him. And you just be the one, you, you were just the one that plucked the right fruit, but you're not the one that planted the tree. You're not the one that watered the tree. You just plucked the fruit from it. And then you thought, look what I made. <laughs> you just plucked it. You didn't make it. You just plucked it. So remember, there's a process in place. There's 1 Corinthians 3.9. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. Right? So when we go out and witness, we're a part of this process. We might not be plucking the fruit every night, but we're planting seeds. Maybe they never thought of these thoughts before, and that's a seed in his mind. Maybe their mom had been witnessing to them, and now we're just watering that seed. Or maybe we're plucking the fruit. So, so when you're dealing with sinners, you have to analyze where they're at and understand that there's this psychological process that takes place in converting sinners to Christ. So have goals. Always have goals. Seek opportunities. Make opportunities. Have an active mindset, not a passive mindset. Just think if you were to witness to one person a day. Just one person a day. Five minutes a day. Just take five minutes of every day of your life to witness to somebody somehow. Gospel track or a conversation or street preaching. Whatever you know, giftings God gave you. If you can just approach a person and talk to them casually, if that's your gifting. To me, it's not like I'm... I can't just approach a stranger and talk to them like out of the blue. Like that's my, I, I'm, that's not my comfort zone. But you know, get me on a street corner. I'm like, hey, y'all need to repent. You know, like that's my comfort zone. I can do that. I'll do that all day. You know what I'm saying? You know. But like the first time I went out to witness, I went to an airport and my friends like, why don't you go talk to somebody? And I just, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't go and talk to somebody out of the blue. I had to. I came up with like a survey. So I could be like an icebreaker. Hey, can I, can I do a survey with you? You know, five minutes of your time to sort of break the ice. But have some goals. If you give out one track a day, that's 365 tracks a year. Think about how many tracks that is in your lifetime. How many people you'd witness to in your lifetime. If you give out 100 tracks a day, what would your impact be? Take an hour of every day and give out 100 gospel tracks. You can do it in an hour. Think about how many tracks you'd give out in your lifetime. It's really a numbers game. Like for every thousand people you witness to, you'll have one convert. So you got to go through the, you know, 999 to get to the one. You know, and uh, that's just the way it works. So have some have some goals on uh, what you want to do. I think witnessing should be such a regular part of the Christian life. A regular Christian discipline for every disciple. Just like daily Bible study. Uh, daily prayer, uh, you should have daily witnessing. It should be a part, it should just be a normal part of every Christian's life that you share your faith. So let's just, uh, we'll end in prayer, pray for the outreach, and uh, we'll head out there. So, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to minister tonight. I pray that some nuggets of truth will find uh, a, an open mind, an open heart, Lord, that we could be better soul winners for you tonight, Lord. I pray for your spirit to come with us. We don't want to go out there without your spirit. We don't want to preach without your spirit. We don't want to witness without your unction and your anointing, Lord. I pray that you just give us the right words at the right time to preach to the right people, Father. Set up some divine appointments tonight. Bring people out there that you've been dealing with, that we might water that seed. Bring people out there who have never been witnessed to before, that we might plant the first seed. Lord, I pray that we'll have some, some uh, ripe fruit that's just uh, ready for the picking out there. 
Lord, I pray that you'll just use us as soul winners. Help us to understand the uh, process that it takes to convert sinners to you, that we might be uh, as effective as possible, that we might deal with people uh, where they're at in the right way. And just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, very good. Thanks for watching our video. I pray that it was a blessing to your life and that you were edified and encouraged by it. Please be sure to like it and leave a comment. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and share our videos with your friends. I've been traveling the country for over 14 years, taking the gospel to the lost, to those who need it the most, because America is in big trouble and is in need of the gospel more than ever before. All it takes to bring me to your area is a plane ticket and a couch to sleep on, and uh, we could preach together or I could preach in your area. But please be sure to keep us in your prayers. We're in need of prayer partners who will get behind us as we're doing battle on the front lines and the devil comes against us. We need Christians who will pray daily for us and for our ministry. And so would you consider becoming a prayer partner with us? Also, we live by faith as a missionary family. We don't know every month where our support's going to come from, but God puts it on people's hearts and he's faithful to provide. And so if God puts it on your heart to bless our ministry and to become a financial supporter, you can do that if you go to our website, openairoutreach.com. So God bless you guys.